Okay, welcome to the dead microphone. Yeah, turn it on. Thank you. I've actually got some on the AV booth, which is kind of a nice, pleasant change. My name is G Mark, G Mark Hardy. I'm here to tell you about Tales from the Crypto. Ooh. By the way, I brought all kinds of really cool swag here, so if you like anything from Ford Beat, if I ask you a question, you give me a reasonably intelligent answer. Come on up, grab something. I got playing cards. I got the regular playing cards, the unclass. And I got the red ones, they're classified. You're only allowed to look at one at a time. Beer glasses, shot glasses, all kinds of other good stuff. So, without further ado, let's begin. Now, I can tell you all about stories you can look up in the library, or I can tell you how to win crypto contests. Want to learn how to make money and win contests and impress people and, like, get the hack, the badge that says Ninja Party Unlocked, things like that? Okay, so, want to buy a beer tonight? I'll tell you stories about World War II crypto, American ciphers, Japanese ciphers, German ciphers. Find a lot of times that cryptography has been present throughout history. It's usually been the determinant about who wins wars. This is not miscellaneous sideline stuff. This is key. This is important. And we look at the early days of crypto to when the point that we figured out how to do asymmetric cryptography. And now what do we have? We've got online commerce with all the great security of SSL. But wait, let's go a little bit down to basics first. Because what I want to show you is kind of the basic moves in which you'll need to learn cryptography. All the crypto contests that I've got and everything you might see out there, for the most part, don't involve using software to go ahead and brute force gigantic numbers. Okay, that's fine and that's great, but that's fun for the computer. What's fun for you? Figuring out all the different components, what makes cryptography work. So I'm going to talk to you about transposition ciphers, where you kind of move things around. Substitution ciphers, where you change one thing for another. And product and exponentiation ciphers, which is in the 102 talk, which we are not doing today. But remember, there is always beer. So on a transposition cipher, what are we talking about? If I've got, let's say, a message attack at dawn, and I want to disguise this thing in a not so terribly difficult code, but I want to make it in such a way that it is relatively difficult for somebody who's intoxicated to figure out, I will go ahead and map that thing across, let's say, four different columns. I could do three, I could do five, I could pick whatever number that makes me happy. And then what would you think the key would be if I'm going to go ahead and put things into four different columns and scramble them? Number four? No. Four digit number? What's specific about that four digit number? The order they're in. Come on up, grab something. So your key in this case would be one, two, three, four, which is a pretty bad key, but nonetheless, it works. You can get attack at dawn because you grab the first column, then this one. Anybody ever see the shirts that uh, Bill Brin used to do with not the Fed? N O T T H E F E D going down this way? Oh, no, no yeah, some light bulbs are coming. Oh, that's what they mean. Okay, so all we've done is we just transpose things. So transposition cipher means what you're going to do is just simply reorder them. And they bring it back out. You can take it with a different key. And the point is, what is preserved in a transposition cipher? The plain text is preserved, and also what is preserved? The letter frequency. Okay, I need a frequent and a plain text up here. I don't want to throw a deck of cards, someone's going to get hurt. I will throw them one at a time. But come on up and grab some. Anyway, honor system, only one piece. So, substitution cipher, probably one of the earliest ciphers that was out there, is known as the Caesar cipher. Why? Who do you think first used it? Caesar. All right, that's not worth anything. <laughs> but it turned out that back then, in the days of the ancient Romans, that being able to come up with a thing that was written was pretty good cryptography. Why? Because 99% of the known world was illiterate. So if you write it down, you win. <laughs> yeah, and it's in Latin, too. Non carborundum illegitimi est, right? Don't let the bastards grind you down. So that's, that's what I got to show for three years of Latin. So anyway, what Caesar Cipher Cypher did is he said, let's take it and shipped it over by a period of three letters. And so now what we do is we'll say A goes to D, B goes to E, C goes to F, and it rotates around the end so Z doesn't go off into the universe. It does come back in A, B, and C. So that is starting to give you an idea of the whole key concept of a lot of cryptography, which is modular arithmetic. So what module are we looking at right here? 26. Mod 26. So you can count either from 1 to 26, or if you see program, it's 0 to 25. But there's never a 27th letter. And so no matter how big that number gets, if you wrap around the end, you just knock off 26s until you get back down within the range. And so now if we take attack at dawn, and we put it in just a straightforward Caesar cipher, 
What do you get? Gwydafin Gwydgidzuk, which you might also hear tonight at some of the parties. <laughs> but there's nothing magic about that particular Caesar cipher. In fact, this is probably the simplest case of a substitution cipher. Because what we're doing here is how many possible Caesar ciphers are there? Who said 25? Come on up, get some. Because 26 is a singularity, it collapses back on itself, right? When your key is zero, A maps to A, B maps to C, C, C and then you better hope that you're back in ancient Rome again where most people are illiterate. Well, if you try to go ahead and do other substitution ciphers, you can come up with lots of different ways to do things. Because a visionaire cipher says, well, hey, we kind of like this idea of a Caesar cipher, but just having one single key doesn't help a whole lot because you've got 25 attempts to try it. And oh, by the way, it also, as I said, someone that said it preserves not only the plain text, but it preserves the frequency information. In the English language, what's the most frequent letter ever used? E, e followed by T, A, O, N, I, R, S, H, all the way down to Q, X, and Z. And you can go back and read some books that have talked about cryptography and you can look at frequency charts, but by and large, that tends to be what you see. By the way, what's the most common character in printed text? Space. The space key, yes. That wasn't a crypto question, that was just a general knowledge, so no goodies for you, but hang in there, you'll get some. <laughs> so anyway, Vision and Cipher says, let's go ahead and pick multiple keys. And then we will encrypt every third or every fourth or every fifth letter with the same Caesar Cipher. So you can see that key of A, would take A to B, because A plus A is B. Think modular arithmetic, A plus P is Q. A plus Y is Z, and then of course you get a B plus Y, it wraps around to A again, and you can start to see that this thing fits into a nice 26 by 26 grid. And so here if we use those things like P-A-R-T-Y, attack at dawn tomorrow, we break it up into groups of five. And this is something that you often saw back in World War II, because the old Hagelin machines, the decoders, would break code up into five character groups. Because how is this usually transmitted? By Morse code. Da -da 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 -da. So what you're going to do is you're going to be sending that and you're going to send it in groups long enough time to get the guy write down the answer and write down what he's getting. So now we'll take a tag at dawn and we're going to encrypt it with a recurring key. Party, 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 party. What does that sound? That sounds like a good idea, right? So A plus P is what? No, it's not the Alexis Park. It is Q. And T plus A you, yeah, okay, and then we go right down the line, we find out that we can add these things right up there, and you get Kulababalix Molilesjiv. And then that is a more robust form of encryption. Now, note what's happened here. We don't have the original plain text anymore. Do we have the same frequency distribution of the letters as we started in the beginning? Anywhere is there the same frequency distribution as in the beginning? Pardon? Every fifth letter, come on up here. Every fifth letter is going to be encrypted with the same key. So if your message is long enough, you can go ahead and use something smart like saying, wow, let's take every fifth letter and see if I can map it to a histogram of the English language. Looking for the peak at E, then T, then A. Well, it's not going to land on that letter, but you're going to see peaks and valleys. And the more information content that's in your message, the more likely it is that they use a really bad encryption scheme. Because then you say, hey, the most frequently one is E, and then the least frequently one would be Z, and go from there. Usually you don't care about the low ones, because you might not even have a Q, X, or Z in your message. So by going ahead and using the most common ones, you can start to make guesses. Now you see the cryptogram that's in the daily newspaper in a lot of cities today, right? How many possible keys are that? It's a simple substitution cipher. Well, A can map to how many other letters? 25. So B can map to any of the remaining 24, 23, 22. So 25 factorial combinations which is a number that I think is actually bigger than our federal deficit this week. <laughs> but, but, you know, yet trying to brute force billions and billions of keys is not the way most people solve that puzzle over a coffee in the morning. How do you do it? You eliminate a lot of those possibilities by looking at the histogram, by looking at the recurring patterns. And so for people who tell you, or vendors that tell you, our cryptography is better because we have a bigger key space than they do, the answer is, so what? Your key space might stink because your algorithm is no good, and so you can, with a pen and a pencil and a cup of coffee, crack something from trillions and zillions of keys. That's not where the security lies. The security lies in the actual cryptography itself 
And the fact that you've got a large key space just means that somebody can't kind of look at it and go, oh yeah, I bet this is this, this is this, this is this, etc. There's another cipher. And again, I'm giving you all these basic primitives because you're going to see these things in crypto contests and find ways to make stuff. Who here has won one of my crypto contests before? All right, a couple of folks. So you're here on my nickel, right? Coming out here from uh, East Coast. Yes. All right. I give away plane tickets. I fly too much, and so I give away round trip plane tickets to people who solve my puzzles. I've given out seven of them, by the way. Southwest, anywhere they fly in the U.S., good for a year. It's best if you use them coming to a hacker conference. Very good. But a Playfair cipher, or sometimes what they call don't cheat. And oh, by the way, anybody go to the Ninja Network party last year? We'll talk about that badge in a minute. You might see something that looks like this. What it involved is taking all 26 letters and putting them into a 25 square grid. Okay, which letter do you think we ought to leave out? Q, Q. yeah, it happens to be. Some places they leave out C, some places they leave other things. This is not too different, as you see it here, from what was called the tap code. Anybody remember where the tap code was used? Yep, yeah, yeah, the POWs in Vietnam. What happened in Hanoi is that if you're a prisoner, you kept you isolated from all the other prisoners. So you weren't allowed to talk to them, you weren't allowed to communicate with them, they beat you if they found out. Well, pretty quickly they developed a tap code that apparently the North Vietnamese never quite figured it out. And what it involved is just giving row and column. You're basically setting an index on this particular grid. So if you want to you know, greet somebody like hello, you know, the first one is a two down, three across, then first row, five, H-E, and then hello and things like that. Pretty basic. But that's sort of one of those encryption things that is just this, what type would you call that? Substitution, right? You're substituting taps for particular letters. Pretty straightforward. And so in this particular case, if we use a key of Hacker Jeopardy needs more crypto, for example, little another cheap plug for Hacker Jeopardy, what we're going to do is we're going to start to populate those letters until we see a repeat. And then we'll skip it because we can't use it more than once, right? And so there's H for Hacker, you know, H-A-C-K-E-R. And I thought I had this in automatic, but it's mad. Okay, Jeopardy, J, we already used E, so we can't use it again, right? Because E's already up there. So we skip it and go to the O. And then P, A, R, D, Y. And then needs more crypto. And now you're going to find out that you just fill in the last of the letters at the end. So just about every time a play for a cipher is going to end in the bottom right corner with a Z, unless there's a Z in your key. And you say, well, is that a weakness? Potentially. Is there a problem here? Well, now that I've got this... Weird looking grid, how do I use it? What I say with the Playfair cipher is that it's again, it's a pretty simple, there's only three rules. And so what the three rules are is that uh, if you have two letters that are in the same row, like I'm trying to encrypt, uh, you know, R, O, I would just simply say R and O are in the same row, so I go to the right one click, J and P. If I'm trying to encrypt, encrypt the pair of letters S, N, S, T, where do you think it goes? M, Y, it wraps around. All right, so this, just think of this thing as like a cylinder that wraps back on itself. If I want to encrypt the letter pairs F, I, they go to G, L. And if I want to encrypt the letter pairs like C, E, it would go to K, H. So in a row, it's pretty straightforward. But you're noticing what I'm doing. I'm breaking it up into two letter groups. Why? Because when I look on my particular grid, I need to have like a start and an end point. But wait, there's more. What if they're in a column? What if I try to encrypt the letter pair AN? What do you think the result would be? JF. Yeah, you just go down one. If I encrypted SW, S goes to G, W goes to C. See how that works? That's rule two. And what's the last possibility? If they're not both in the same row or they're not both in the same column, they're in different rows and columns. Is that a problem? Not at all. So if I want to encrypt the letter pair H and S, I just kind of make a little opposite corners. H goes to C, S goes to Y. If I encrypt J and I, it would go J goes over in the same column I as, it becomes a P. I goes back over to J's column, it's an F. Do I ever have to worry about wrapping around when I'm doing something like that? No, I don't, because it's not going to wrap around. So the wrap around is only going to get you if you're both in the same row or the same column. So it's like an infinite thing here, infinite thing here, but the opposite corners work. So with those three simple rules, I can now take the now is the time for all, you know, good men to come to the age of their country, and I'll break it up into two-letter pairs. 
Now, here's the problem. If I've got the letter LL at the end for all, what do I do with LL? Where does LL go to? 